This edition of the 10% Show is brought to you by Roscoe's, the hottest bar in town. And in part by Outlines, the voice of Chicago's gay and lesbian community. He's on his height. She's Sarah Siegel. Overlooking Belmont Avenue. From the sunroom of Ann Satter's restaurant, it's, it's the, the 10% percent Show. What started as an encounter on New York subway with a man lost to delirium from AIDS became a riveting examination into this modern day epidemic. The LA based actor Michael Kearns went on to develop a one man, six character show that has played to audiences on both coasts and recently here in Chicago at the Halsted Street Theater. Joining me today is the author, the uh, playwright, rather, the uh, actor and the director of Intimacies, Michael Kearns. Hi. Michael, thanks a lot for being with us. Um, I'm going to ask you, basically, it's, it's a very interesting play. It's a very controversial play. Mm -hmm. It's controversial for its content. It's controversial for the people who are in it. There are six characters, all distinct, all different. It's uh, basically a 70-minute play uh, consisting of a series of monologues. And um, I'd like to ask you, what, what was the influence uh, to do this play? Well, since the beginning of the 80s, as you referred to, um, I've been involved in a lot of AIDS theater. Um, as a director, as an actor, and I've realized that most of these pieces are dealing with the dilemma of the white gay male. And I actually got tired of it and also felt that on one hand we're screaming this is not only a white gay male disease but on the other hand the theater and the television certainly seemed to depict the plight of the white gay male and the media also a lot and I felt that there was a vast community of other people suffering with and around AIDS that weren't being fully um, explored or they weren't given an opportunity to speak so I wanted to give them an opportunity to voice their emotions about this disease as well as their feelings in general I mean intimacies is strung together by the common thread of AIDS but also it's six people telling their very individual stories which encompass homelessness and drug addiction and single motherhood and a lot of other issues that confront what we will all confront in the 90s. Shortly after I had my chin implant, I told this guy my name was Patrick, and he said, did you say perfect? I'm close to perfect. I paid for it. I wasn't born this way. Teeth, nose, cheekbones, all done best hair cutter in the city and I go to the gym three hours a day seven days a week easy to imagine somebody thought my name was perfect being perfect ain't easy I work at it I also have the perfect car condo and closet full of clothes Barry my lover also perfect rich gorgeous powerful we're in the entertainment industry he's an agent at William Morris I'm an accountant at Disney perfect people are always saying I look like I'm an actor but I think that's just because I'm gay. Not that I'm completely out of the closet. Neither is Barry. I mean, we're out. Except to our parents. And at work. Sometimes we even take dates to office functions. 
We have to. It's just part of the Hollywood game. We don't need to march in gay pride parades or any of that bullshit. We make a yearly donation, $50 each, to AIDS Project, anonymously. Our lifestyle is really our own business. When I asked about these, I really resented a plastic surgeon suggesting I have the test. I mean, look at me. Do I look sick? Barry and I have been together for seven years. Has it been a monogamous relationship, the doctor wanted to know? It's been perfect, I told him. I know Barry has been faithful to me, and I've only cheated a couple of times. Well, not cheated, really. Fooled around the gym. <laughs> Do you and your lover have safe sex? The doctor had the nerve to ask. Of course not. Why would we? We've been together for seven years. It's perfectly monogamous. Barry thinks. I can't destroy that. Besides, he might leave me, and I can't stand to be alone, for Christ's sake. Barry doesn't like to fuck. I do the fucking in the family, so when this really hot guy came on to me at the gym, I let him fuck me. You don't usually carry a condom into the steam room at the sports connection now, do you? It happened once a week for several months. He is an actor to die for. Oh, it was perfect. He's clean cut. Look at me. Do I look sick? Fuck it, I said. I'll take the test. There's no way, no way. Get AIDS in the steam room at the gym looking the way I do? Come on, get serious. When the doctor told me I was positive, I thought he must be kidding. Not me. Look at me. Do I look sick? Then I thought about the actor. He didn't look sick. He couldn't have given it to me. He's a TV star. There was this kid a couple of years before the actor. Maybe it was him. I let him fuck me in the john on the lot at Disney. <laughs> Dick of death. That was before we knew anything about AIDS. He worked in the mail room. <laughs> He was black. Even though he was clean, Barry would die. Who? Who gave it to me? I can't be positive. Are you sure about your lover, the doctor asked, like he's in some third-rate movie of the week. No, I lied. It probably is his fault. But I'd know. Barry's not a good liar like I am. I'd know. The doctor lectured me about protecting Barry immediately, but I can't. I can't tell anyone, and I sure as hell can't tell Barry. Tell him I've given him AIDS for Christmas. Come on, get serious. The only answer is to kill myself. I never wanted to get old anyway. What's that line? Live fast, die young, have a beautiful corpse. I'm just going to disappear. There'll be no revelations, no screaming parents. No obituary and variety of the Hollywood Reporter. No crow's feet. No 40th birthday party. No 20th high school reunion. No 10th year anniversary with Barry. No more lies. No more bullshit. No more plastic surgery. No more hating myself. 
No more hangovers, no more sex and bushes and johns. No more cocaine. No more poppers. No more steroids. No more. No more. No more. No more hope. Like Norman Maine and the star is born. I'm just going to walk into the Pacific Ocean at sunset. Judy will be singing in the kitchen. A perfect Hollywood ending. Perfect. Many of you are familiar with her weekly cartoon in The Reader, but Heather McAdams is also an independent filmmaker. Meet Bradley Harrison Picklesheimer. Heather's latest documentary features the life and times of a female impersonator from Lexington, Kentucky. Heather, uh, how did you meet Bradley? Uh, I was teaching at the University of Kentucky, and he was a local celebrity in Lexington, Kentucky. Did you happen in uh, to his bar, or? Well, everybody in town knew Bradley, and uh, except uh, people that didn't live in Kentucky, so I thought I'd bring it to the rest of the world. But I did meet him at his bar, and uh, as as a straight woman, how do you think that um, Bradley helps uh, lessen the gap between um, the gay and straight culture? Well, I think that he. Uh, I, sometimes I say even if he hadn't been gay, I might have made the film anyway. Um, I think that he uh, was able to be my friend mm -hmm. and uh, be a good friend at that. And so um, I thought I'd make a film about my pal. But he's also real smart. Not that most gay or drag queens aren't smart. But he uh, he's very funny and colorful. And uh, I thought that he would be an interesting subject. You know, I'm doing a public service. I mean, I'm making it a lot easier for everybody to just handle somebody when they see them out on the street because, you know, I shop, I eat food, I go to restaurants and eat, I buy clothes, you know, like people go, what do you do in the daytime? Well, what the fuck do you think I do in the daytime? Well, um, I think that um, it really gets down to what the person is like and not what segment they'll, they'll be classified in according to their sexual. And um, I would, it's sort of like do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. I wouldn't want anybody to make value judgments about me because of my sexual preference. Mm -hmm. And I hope to be able to do that with other people. Well, if I happen to see a 500-pound fat woman with a huge, you know, like stretch polyester outfit on in a supermarket or anywhere, and she would laugh at me. If someone that was so hideous and so ugly to laugh at me, it's like, eat another Twinkie fatso. And I think he should be a star. So I, I decided to break that rule of, well, I think documentary people think they have to cover all sides. I just showed what I thought was the fantastic side of Bradley. But I did tell his sad story. He does have a sad story. Really? He told a sad story. I've been going to funerals since I was uh, five years old. And at the age of 25, I had been to 36 funerals. <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't think that's really fair. You know, and I know people who are in their 30s and 40s that have both parents, both sets of grandparents, and it just blows my mind. You know, it's like, when's the last time you went and saw me? Like, oh, Christmas or Thanksgiving and shit, you know. It's like, I don't have a home to go to anymore. You know, I don't have, Christmas is never going to be the same. Thanksgiving will never be the same. You know, 
it's it's a really weird time of year. I never considered myself an orphan, but that's initially what I was at the age of 14 when my dad died. My mom died when I was seven, my dad died when I was 14. And, you know, when the holidays come around, you know, you don't know, like some people are very nice, they know that you don't have any parents, and so they're like, well, come over, come over with my family and have Thanksgiving dinner, you know? And it is a nice gesture, but then it's like you just stick out like a sore thumb, and you don't want to do that because it just it just makes it all more worse. So it's just another day, all those holidays and things. Are. I like them and everything. I like the decorations for them, but it's not ever going to be the same, you know, like it was when you were a kid and wake up on Christmas Day and there's tons of presents and or the way Thanksgiving smells when you first wake up, you know, and shit like that. So. The only family I really have left is my little sister, and uh, she's a lesbian bodybuilder. <laughs> and uh, we get along real well. She does male drag in my shows. We both have plots in the cemetery. And when it comes time for me to go, they're not going to have to drag my ass very far down the street to take it to where it's finally going to be. So that's kind of nice. I like that. I love that cemetery. I know it like the back of my hand. Well, I like I like to see the rest of the drag queens in Bradley's show as he does a voiceover explaining about their lives, and one of them does a half breed by Cher, and um, <laughs> Rhonda K. Steele. Um, That's great. That, that should be. Fun. I just like some of his offhanded remarks and a shot of him walking his pit bull, and I like oh the very last scene. The very last scene is to Ema Sumac, and he's crawling on the beach. He's crawling out of the beach in a mermaid outfit in in Florida, out of the ocean. I mean. It's a great guy. It's a great gal, too. <laughs> Chicago's longtime literary activist Marie Kuda was celebrated recently at a joint birthday party and the 15th anniversary reunion of the Lesbian Writers Conference. We had an opportunity to share the festivities and to talk to Marie about her own coming out process and her thoughts on the state of lesbian literature. This evening we're celebrating not only your birthday but the 15th uh, reunion of the Lesbian Writers Conference. Now, we heard a bit about how that gets started. In fact, we, we are also hearing stories by um, people who, who have recollections. Uh, I, I want to go a little bit farther back in your past and uh, ask you, how did you come out? How? When? when? Why? Well, I think that I've, I've been gay without knowing what that meant or lesbian without knowing what it meant all my life. I can remember as a child um, having women-oriented everything, never been interested in, in little boys except as uh, competitors. Um, but I didn't get interested, if you mean coming out in the movement, uh, until the late 60s. I alluded to that. It was uh, in connection with a relationship I was having with a woman. Um, got in touch with the Mattachine organization, and through them, realized that there were lots of other gay people out there, and a lot of them were women, and that they didn't know their history, and I didn't know their history. I graduated with a degree in literature and had read probably two women novelists. So I spent the next 20 years trying to uh, track um, and share um, what I found with other women. And you founded Women Press as a result? Early on, um, because of the Lesbian Writers Conferences, mostly to get out the information that we had gleaned uh, and share that with other women, I founded a small press, and like many other women that founded small presses, found it was a losing business. <laughs> Publishing in this country is in the hands of uh, not only men anymore, but corporations and conglomerates, and they take publishing the losing end of it as a write-off for their taxes. And yet we're able to celebrate tonight uh, something that was very, very vital, and uh, and women's, women's fiction is still being published. Publish. And um, in fact, I wonder, you're, you're the perfect person to, uh, to let me know how, how should we be supporting lesbian literature today? Well, there was a time in the mid-70s when we had hoped to create some kind of a women's economic network where women who were writers 
could then go to women presses and have them printed and go to women publishers and have them published. They'd be sold in women's bookstores. And I think that kind of fantasy died a little bit. Um, we have some of the stores, we have some of the books, we have some of the writers, but we never, we never were able to create that economic network. Uh, for the future, um, I think the mainstream is try, will, will co-opt us to a certain degree as we are saleable. Uh, they've done that already in terms of biographies. Hardly a biography of any woman that had a relationship with another woman comes out without it being screamed that she was a lesbian. Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, um, Virginia Woolf, you name it, whoever. Uh, is the mainstream using us more now uh, and, and publishing more of our fiction and biographies oh, sure. now? Oh, sure, but then they put, their, they put their criteria on it. For instance, when... Uh, Daughters Press bought out Rita Mae Brown's um, Ruby Fruit Jungle. It went through 11 printings, 90,000 copies, okay? The mainstream press decides that's too much money to be going in those directions. So they bring out 3.5 million copies. You buy it in your supermarket and every place else. Sure, they co-opt you. The next books that Rita Mae Brown brings out are less and less... I think, lesbian content. That's no reflection on her, but it shows what's marketable. And if you want to play the game by the big boys' rules, Valerie Taylor, who was at the writers' conferences in the old days, told us when she was given a book, they had to have sex by page so-and-so. When you came to the end of the book, the lesbian had to either be run over by a car or go off on the arms of a big stud or whatever, or you wouldn't get published. And the rules are more subtle now, but they're still there. So when you go to the mainstream presses, that's what's going to happen. Female impersonators from all over the country took center stage down the runway of beauty, charm, and poise in pursuit of the Miss Gay Continental 1990 title. We'll show you what few get to see as the 10th percent show lifts the backstage curtain. When you're judging a competition, what types of things do you look for? Well, well talent, poise, um, the personality, the, the, the way they look. I'm sure that they're just inside is just so nervous and they want to just throw up or whatever. <laughs> Don't even want to come out, but I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh, well, we look for stage presence. We look for um, talent, um, how they carry themselves on stage, the personality how they look, um, their dance routines, how much work they put into things like that. I'm not nervous. I'm not really nervous at all, to tell you the truth. Ginger, do we do the same the exact same way that we did? Everything. We got this woman the same way. Two points. Boom. One point. Step. Boom and off. Okay. No more. Today, two points. Walk out, stop, begin to stop, and off the ramp. Okay. Get, out on these shoes. Get a shot of these shoes. They're 20 feet tall. You know, I have put mine in my bag. You have any Have you got a one? I'm on my train. I'm on my train. right here. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. How was it upstairs? I was fabulous. I got over the jitters. <laughs> All the nervousness is gone now. Is this your first time? Though? No, I've been here four years. Yeah. What makes you nervous? What makes you, I don't know. I think it's something, if you don't be nervous a little bit, you don't have it. You don't want it. Uh, what's it like being in Chicago at the, 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 this contest? It's fabulous. Yesterday, one of the performers took me shopping. We went all over. We went to Bloomingdale's, I Magnum, Neiman Marcus. Then she took me on the beach. God, it was like a candy store. All those men out there on the, in the surf and the sand and the mussels it was fabulous. Did you pick any of them home with you? No, but I called a few over. There was one shy one. His name was Doug. He took too long making up his mind if he was going to take him out to dinner or not. So I told him, Doug, forget it. It's over. Were you in your uh, swimsuit? when you were out mm -hmm. there? The swimsuit that I wore this evening. Hello. Hi. Welcome from 
Atlanta, greetings. This is on your openings. <laughs> Wait, yeah, yeah, I would have to say, um, yeah. Catherine Hepburn. Mm -hmm. I would love to do it how she did it. As a performer? Mm -hmm. People you My mother, because she performed a lot <laughs> as I was growing up, and it was really tough. <laughs> what about you? Just a, <laughs> have I modeled? No, not yet. Well, she's on before me. Who is number This is in real life. Can you tell her our hands are older? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Your finger, daughter. This is from Let me tell you if each one is doing it. Good luck to all of you. I love you, shoes. You make it through the night, it'll be beautiful tomorrow. Self-described as a radical lesbian Jewish folk singer, Frank, spelled P-H-R-A-N-C, spoke with us about her life and work during a recent concert at the Lounge X nightclub. Go for it. Uh, We're back with Frank on Gay Cable Network. That was spontaneous. <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, I have something to ask you. Okay, obviously Martina has made quite an impression on you. Is there any more to it than that? Ooh, have you ever met her? Yes, I met her once at a dinner party, and I didn't wash my hand for a couple of days. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, when I was in, uh, was I, where was I last night? In Detroit. The night before, I got crank phone calls at my hotel, where this one woman demanded, first it was so strange, I mean, like I'm Van Halen or something, you know, a crank <laughs> phone call at the hotel. And she called him, and she said, this is Frank. I said, yeah. Okay. So how'd you get this number? She goes, I just called the hotel and asked. She goes, but I have a really important question to ask you. And I said, well, what? You know, she says, I want to know, is Martina a close personal friend, or did you just write the song about her? <laughs> I said, I just wrote the song. She's not a close personal friend. She said, great, that's all I wanted to know. See you tomorrow. Bye. And she, like, hung up, and it was mm. just the weirdest. You know, <laughs> People were always intrigued by that. Yeah, I mean, sure. I did. I touched her once, but... Mm. I don't know if she's heard the song or not. I hope she. I hope she likes it. I hope oh, her and Judy too. enjoy it. Yeah, I love the little tidbit of gossip. And by the <laughs> way, <laughs> who she's living with now? <laughs> well, for a long time. I mean, come on, she's got a world's record of stable relationships. Doesn't she? And a horse. Right. Horses. Horses. Horse 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 yeah, right. She's got a horse stable now. So, do you really frequent Toys R Us? Yes, I do. When you're down. Absolutely. It's the only remedy. When I go there, I think of you. <laughs> it's the only surefire remedy for depression, I think. Really. <laughs> toys. Yeah, toys. Especially the toy food aisle. That's my favorite yeah. aisle. So. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't come across that one. No, toy food. Yeah, you've never been on that aisle of Toys R Us? No, could you explain? Oh, it's the greatest. It's the, it's the aisle that has all the children's, the toy kitchen appliances, mm -hmm. and all the fake food. And they have, like... Uh, all the mainstream chains, you know, have the plastic, like Dunkin' Donuts has plastic donuts and <laughs> McDonald's and those people. But the best is this company, I think from Japan, called Foodles, and they have, uh, like, fake uh, deli pack, like plastic bologna and plastic American cheese. It's just like the real thing. And plastic <laughs> bread and uh, plastic lettuce and, um, and plastic ding-dongs and all this great stuff. And what I like to do is get the sandwich pack with the two slices of bread, the plastic tomato, the plastic lettuce, and the bologna, and the cheese, and uh, keep it in my car, and make up a little sandwich, and then when I'm at the stoplights, <laughs> kind of with my friend in the car, we both have our sandwiches, our, our plastic sandwiches in, in our hands, and kind of take a big <laughs> bite out, you know, and it looks real to everyone else at the stoplights, so we get the kick out of that. It's and you've got them all major full. Thrill. Yeah, yeah and I get such a thrill out of that. <laughs> So I said they're definitely one of my favorite aisles at, at, uh, at Toys R Us. Do you still swim? Yeah, uh, but I haven't been competing for a number of years. Um, oh, I didn't realize that you not, competed as well. When I swam on the Santa Monica College swim team the with the girls, mm -hmm. from the song One of the Girls, 
Yes, I swim butterfly and freestyle sprints. And I'm very out of shape today, and all I do is kind of do a lot of surfing these days. Really? I swim a little bit. Not, I don't compete, but I, I do surf a lot. Do you wear a bikini? <laughs> uh, I have been known to roll in, but I find no. it to be extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> I like a good speedo. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a nice show. Uh, some light crap. You want some security. <laughs> yeah. Do you have plans for a new album? Or are you pretty much just concentrating on this one with your tour? Yeah, uh, I have a few more little things I'd like to do with this album and to finish up this tour. And then I have some uh, surprises I'd like to kind of release, and I'm, I'm working on the new record. I'm working on it in my head mainly when I'm on the road here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm writing a little bit on the road. It's mm -hmm. different for me because I've never uh, never had to write on the road, but I don't have time now. And always I've been out on the road since July, and wow. I've been home like a total of two and a half weeks. So. Starting with the poems? The no, starting in, I started in July in England, and I was over there till the end of August, and then I came home for like three days, and then I went out with the poems, mm -hmm. and then I went home for two weeks, and then I came out on this tour, so. Great. Yeah. Life is good. Life is good. I'm a life lover, yes. Only one ear, please, because I look like a pixie with two. Lesbian and gay characters and situations have been popping up more and more on primetime TV. Now comes a soap just for us. Produced in California, Secret Passions comes to Chicago via the 10% show. In the months to come, we'll be bringing you episodes on this portrayal of gay and lesbian life in the 90s. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. What a glorious morning. And now I'd like to introduce the Reverend Arthur Dimsdale. Indeed, brothers and sisters, it is a glorious morning. Glorious morning in the Lord. I look out over the beauties of the heavens and the earth. I look out over your beautiful holy faces and I see the great power, the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I see the great salvation he has visited upon us. Now, there's a darkness creeping across this glorious morning. An evil, more monstrous and more insidious I had prepared a different sermon for this morning, one more in keeping with my reputation. Yesterday, yesterday I saw this evil that's festering even now across our land. A moment ago, we sang that God was a mighty fortress, and that he is. But now, brothers and sisters, that fortress is being besieged by Satan himself. Even now, Lucifer is rising from that bottomless pit, that sea of everlasting fire and damnation, to rise against us. Even now, Lucifer sits among us. I've always been a Christian. We're gonna be late again. I know, I know. I'll be right there. John's not ready either. Could you please knock on his door? Knock? Yeah, please, just do it. Okay, okay. 
We don't have time to argue. I did knock first. Your mother thinks I might have interrupted something I shouldn't. Dad. Well, come on, John. We gotta go. Church starts in 30 minutes. And you know how your mother is. Yeah, I know. Listen, would it be so bad if I didn't go? Yeah, it would. It's Sunday morning in Orange County, California, and I'm the DA who has a reputation to uphold. But no buts. Now, you're my son, and like always, we public figures have an image to maintain. I'm sorry about that. Look, I can't go. John, is something wrong? Do you want to talk? No. I mean, it's just school and things, that's all. Okay, I'll tell you what. After church, how about a game of one-on-one? -on -one? Just you and me. You know, like we used to. That is, if you take it easy on your old man. Okay, Dad. Whatever you want. Look, I'll be done in a minute, okay? Just this once. Mm, darling, a wrinkled suit won't do much to uphold your image. I could take it out. Mm. <laughs> Jesus! As usual, my son, your timing is impeccable. Do I have to knock before I walk into my own kitchen? Well, listen, psychiatrists say that running parents make a family feel secure. They make me feel embarrassed. Are we going to go or what? I'll get it! Hello? That's for me. I'm up for China. Yeah, hi. Hold on. It's for me. Look, I can't talk now. John, it's important. I gotta talk to you. Really? Well, Christ's sakes, David. Dad'll kill me if he knew I was talking to you. Where are you, David? I'm about six blocks away. John, I need your help. I'm in some really deep trouble. Look, I can't talk. We're on our way to church. John, please. I'm the only, you're the only friend I've gotten back. Please help me. Jonathan, we're waiting. Oh, just a sec, okay? I'll be right there. Look, I can't talk. Call me later. Wait, uh... There may not be a later. Okay, listen. We meet at St. Pete's in about an hour, okay? After Mass. But my folks will be... John! Hurry up! John, please. I've got to see you. Hi. Okay, one hour, okay? Here we go again. Why do you always do this? What? No sooner do we finish and you jump off and like I've left her sick. Don't start. Start? I barely finished. First you bitch because we never do it. Then we do it and you bitch because it doesn't last for 12 hours. You know, Neil, I know you've heard of foreplay. But have you ever heard of afterplay? A hug, a kiss, anything. Breathe on me. Satisfied? I feel better. Oh, I, I can't open a store today. I've got things to do. 
Great. Thanks for the advance warning. What's the big deal? You have any business on Sundays anyway. All fags are too busy having brunch. Are you hungry, baby? Don't start. I'm not starting anything. It's... Never mind. I'll open the store and work the fundraiser tonight. Oh, good. Maybe next time you won't be so ready to jump whenever Mr. Charles coming off bars. He does spend a lot of money in my store. Why do all fags have to be such damn kiss asses? Everybody should have a hobby. You know, you never complained much before. Sometimes, Stan, you can be a real pain in the ass. <laughs> That's not what you said a few minutes ago. Someday, lover boy, your mouth's gonna get you in a whole lot of trouble. Where are you going? Out. I thought we were gonna have breakfast together. You know, just the two of us. Wrong. But I thought that's the agreement. Remember, I do what I want when I want to. Any more questions? No, I'm sorry. Will you be in time for the back in time for the fundraiser? <laughs> Wouldn't miss it. Maybe tonight Mr. Cavanaugh will finally get what he deserves. Why do you hate him so much? Why not? He's rich, he's powerful, and he's a fag. You too, baby. Can't you tell? Yesterday, I learned a new candidate has entered the race for our local city council. A lawyer, a black woman and a lesbian. And tonight, this, at, 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 at a local saloon given over to their lecherous desires, this, this woman, this lesbian, is holding a fundraiser. She's trying to raise money to become one of our lawgivers, to become one of our representatives of our community. But I want to let her know she does not represent me. She does not represent anything I believe in. She has no place in this community, and she will never, ever have any authority over my children. Until today, I have conscientiously striven to separate politics from the word of the Lord. But I can be silent no longer, and neither must you. Now I ask you to pray with me. Tonight, I ask you to stand with me at the, at the doors, the very doors of that, that abomination, that cesspool. Let these homosexuals know they've got no place in our community, in our homes. Let them know, brothers and sisters, that we stand as soldiers of the Lord, steadfast in our faith and tireless in our hatred of their perversion. Let them know, brothers and sisters. Let them know. Now, I want you to call the number you see on the bottom of the screen. Serve with me tonight. Stand with me tonight. The Lord will bless you for it. Hello. 
Ms. Shuela, this is Elise Wolf, Mr. Kavanaugh's assistant. I'm calling for Mr. Kavanaugh. Good morning, Elise. Why aren't you in church today? Mr. Kavanaugh would like to talk to you. So around uh, two this afternoon? Sorry, I'm busy. Tell him I'll talk to him tonight at the fundraiser. Uh, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. And perhaps you have wax in your ears. I said I was busy. Mr. Kavanaugh would like to talk to you. Honey, Lincoln freed the slaves. I don't jump every time the great white master calls. May I remind you, Ms. Schwera, this is politics, not the Civil War. He's agreed to endorse your candidacy for city council, and his influence could very well secure you the election. Miss Wolf, I do surely appreciate his endorsement, and his support tonight on the fundraiser will be very helpful financially. But I'm the candidate in this election, not Mr. Kavanaugh. And if he thinks he's buying Pinocchio on the street, I have a major surprise for him. And for you, too. Two o'clock, Miss Shuela. And do be prompt. Girlie, your ears must be foolish. I said that I will not be there at two or at any other time. You know, calling a news conference on Sunday afternoon is such a bother. It's always so difficult to get those L.A. stations down here. But I can, Miss Shuela, and I will. See you at two. Crooked bitch. Both of them. <sighs> sure be nice if somebody fixed me breakfast. Hey, this is an equal opportunity household. You can handle it. That was worth a try. So what do you like for practicing half the night? This is an important gig tonight, Paula. You just don't understand. I do understand, baby. I just wish... Never mind. This is your day. What do you wish? Nothing. No, what? Forget it. You make me crazy when you do that. today? One. Should I be there too? No. You just worry about staying talented. I'll worry about business. I can handle Chaz all by myself. What time can we be at the front of house? About 2.30. 3 at the latest. Great. You're so together. I just love that about you. So where's my breakfast? No time. <laughs> I got a rehearsal to be at. After tonight, hon, the world will be ours. Yeah, I can see it now. Casey Buchanan, master of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, Mr. Kavanaugh. No, no, not yet. I have both Rudy and Tony out looking for him right now. <laughs> They'll find him. He's just a scrawny kid with no money, no place to go. <laughs> How far is he gonna run? Boss, you worry too much. They'll find him. And they'll get it back for you. I know that. Boss, listen. As soon as I hear anything, I promise I will give you a call. Jerk. I wonder if Rudy's hungry. That 
punk ever gets in my sights. Yeah. Tony, this better be good news. Look, you are supposed to be out looking for that kid. Where? Sorry? Well, hold on. Um, and two root beers. No, that's okay. what that was calling. What? Not me up? No, that'll do it. But no, no. He's outside the market on Harbor making a phone call. I don't know. He hasn't got it. Anyway, we'll just tag him till he does. You were to take him out and bring me back the package. I told you, he doesn't have it. Kavanaugh is all over my butt. Find the kid, get the package, understand? <laughs> How's it hanging, little buddy? Let go of me, man. Sure, pal, as soon as you tell me what this is all about. I've got something. Something valuable. So why do you come to me? Because you hate Chaz Kavanaugh. And what I got will put his butt in a real swing. You still haven't answered my question. Why me? Because you hate Chaz Kavanaugh. Everyone knows... Everybody knows nothing. What is it? Show it to me. I can't. I just want it with me. Why, you little wimp? Up. Why? Show me the money. Why? I haven't even seen the merchandise yet. I need the money. I have to get out of town. Not so fast, hotshot. Tell me what it is first. Show me the money. What is it? The money. Two hundred? I told you a grand. Take it or leave it. I need a grand. Fine. Get into the fire. Neil, wait. You gotta help me. They're after That's me. That's tough, kid. Stand real still, cutie pies. Don't even blink. Who is this? The pair of pansies trying to stab another pansy in the back. He gave us a pretty good chase. But now, I need the package. I don't have it. Where is it? Listen. He called me, asked me for money. That's all. I don't even know what it is. Too bad, pretty boy. Wrong place, wrong time. Get him! Get him! Simon is not going to like this. Hey, boss, it's me. No, we had him, but he got away. I understand, Mr. Greenstreet, I understand. No, he didn't have it with him. How the hell should I know where he stashed it? We found him once, we'll find him again. Oh, for Christ's sake, Simon, will you give me a break? I didn't lose it, you did. I told you we'd find him. Oh, well, don't worry. We'll be back in plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. I'm falling in. You know, I'll give you a ride to your bike. You're about two hours early. And you're a slut. Where's Chaz? Upstairs, in the middle of a massage. Tell Chaz Paula's going to be here at one and Ms. Shuela will be here at two. Do you think you can handle that? Bitch is here. Is anyone else? If only Mrs. Hitler. We're almost through anyway. 
Oh, no, we're not. Whatever you say, boss. It's a glorious morning. Don't you think you ever did it a little bit? We devoured the flesh of our sons and daughters. You think so? I thought that was rather good. Strong, biblical. Still, oh, Holly, this is a war. I'll bet you the pledge is this Sunday up over 20%. Just remember what happened to Jerry Falwell in Sacramento. The gay church... That gay church! Lord must shut every time he hears that word. Falwell still got sued and lost. And what he said wasn't nearly as inflammatory as you, what you were doing this morning. Let him sue. That publicity won't be a problem at all. So, what happens now? Well, you get your butt out there and you sign up, my brethren, for the first battle in my war. Sign him up, Harley. Yeah, tell him to meet you back here. So I understand that that little uh, homosexual party is supposed to begin at seven. That means we have the pickets in place by six. Or at this time, don't forget to call the media. We're going to need lots of television and newspaper coverage. Whatever, Ryan. What are you up to? Why, whatever do you mean, Ollie? I'm just doing my Christian duty. How many pickets do you want? Well, whole congregation would be nice. Look good on the 11 o'clock news. Oh, and by the way, I've got already arranged a meeting tomorrow morning with Marty Skulnick, our incumbent city councilwoman, and of course, our inimitable district attorney, Mr. Saul Stevens. When you get done out there, you come back in here. We've got things for you to do. Special things. Things only you can do. You know, that was a really great show. It was a great show, and the hour went by so fast. So much was happening in Chicago. Yeah, I look forward to next month. Yeah, join us next month for more events and happenings here in gay and lesbian, lesbian Chicago. Chicago. of the 10% show is brought to you in part by Roscoe's if you love the best dance music and the friendliest people Roscoe's is the place to go in the heart of the community and by Outlines Magazine the voice of Chicago's gay and lesbian community <laughs>